I'm Josh Warrington and I'm a fighter by trade. I think um, as a young lad, you, know, you watch the big fights and you think, wow, you know, I'd love to be there. And you know, there's, there's been times when I've drove past Ellen Road and I thought, you know, I wouldn't mind fighting there one day. And you know, you just you drive past him a bit of all, you know, picturing yourself being there. And any time I've been on the pitch to, to announce a fight or to promote a fight or anything like that, I kind of thought, eh, hey, imagine fighting here. You know, if I've been one of my pals, I'd be like, imagine fighting here, boys. And they turn around and say, hey, well, you're going to be in a few years' time, Josh. And I turn around and say, oh, I won't mind it, boys. And then the rest of the match, I'd be watching the match, but I'd also be picturing a ring there and, and just, you know, fighting and the old crowd, how it'd be reacting. And it's, that's go back to that visualisation thing. I kind of pictured that over the years and now it's here. Thanks for inviting us into your home, Josh. Is this all the free stuff you get sent now? You're world famous. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do get some. Uh, do get some stuff sent, but this is uh, just bits of my merchandise. What you know, I sell. You know, it's funny. You you just an average show on the street, and all of a sudden you become you become a bit of an I don't know a label. You know, you, you, just as yourself. I mean, not changed about me, but you know, people more the more people recognise you, more they want to be part of you. And uh, you know, we start you know got his logo, own logo and. You know, there was own bit of me um, merchandise and, and, and bits of memorabilia, and you know, I, I, I sell the gloves, you know, sign them up and stuff like that. But half the time, I end up just giving them away. You know, I can't help myself with charities, and that's one good thing that uh, I can always give myself a pat on back on the shoulder because I must have raised tens of thousands of pounds for charity, yeah. and uh, that's something I can really be proud of. But you know, I've got all sorts of things. When, when in you there. first um, went out in Leeds or wherever you went, and you saw someone wearing a. Josh Warren and merch. What did you feel like? Did you feel like one of the Kaiser Chiefs? Oh man, it's, it's tingles. Do you think you're Richie Wilson? It's tingles, of the, you know, it's, yeah, it's, it smiles from ear to ear. You know, you, it's a bit surreal to see someone wearing a t-shirt with your name on it. It's, uh, I don't know. It, it's, I remember one of the first times I, I seen it, and I was pinching myself. I couldn't believe it. You know, it's. Um, I mean, it, it's, it becomes a bit of the norm, but I still, you know, I have to like bring myself back down to earth and think, wow, you know, it's it's crazy to think that. You, know, you see people walking about with like Team Leeds Warrior and Josh Warren and you know they're proud and they're proud to wear that. You know I, I see people going on holiday with you know Spain or whatever just spotting me Josh Warren in t-shirt. You know it's Leeds <laughs> shirts, all Leeds Rhino shirts, but yeah they're wearing that and it's going it's going around the world. So I uh, I appreciate all the support. I mean, you've got great support, but do you feel there's I don't want to use the word pressure. There's always pressure on a boxer yeah, when he fights yeah. a big fight. But, but do you think there's even more expectation now? Because um, as we speak at the moment, the football season hasn't gone well for Leeds and they're unlikely to make the playoffs barring a mad run and someone collapsing. Yeah, yeah, there's, there's always pressure, like you say, um, even more so now. But I think I've learned to deal with that over the years of being at the arena, fighting it in front of tens of thousands of people. I mean, uh, that comes with experience and you can't really teach that. You come across as... Um, a well-known boxer who's reachable to the public, yeah. pretty much like Ricky Hatton was. Yeah. So many of them Leeds fans who have a story to say about when they met you or might have seen you in town one day, even if it was just shopping. They've all got, a, it seems like Ricky Hatton, the Ricky Hatton era, they've all got a Josh Warrington story to tell. Yeah. That's personal to yeah, them. Yeah, of course, and I've said many times, and I always keep saying it, it's the people that make you, and I can't deal with people who think they're too big just because of a bit of limelight or change, and that ain't my, you know, personality, it's not me whatsoever. Um, and, and I think you get to a certain stage where you, you've got to give back to the people who've been there and supporting you. You can't like turn around and give them two things or like think you're too big to speak to them. I could go like down the street, like for instance, at last weekend I went and did a bit of shopping and a fellow were in there and uh, he came up and he said, oh, can I have a picture? And we had a bit of chat about boxing, genuine boxing fan. And he said, you know what, I'm having a shite day until I, I spoke to you. And I, I really appreciate it. I said, man, no worries, mate, shook his hand. And that's the difference you can have. You can make someone's day. For me, I'm just having a chat. And, and for him, he's come away, get in, I've, I've had a good day there. So, yeah, it's, it, you're in a position and you've got to use it for the good, I think, you know what I mean? And you forget, like, young kids, they see what you're doing and you've got, you don't want to be walking around thinking you're too big for your boots. Because it rubs off on them, they look at you as an influence, so, you know, so my mentality. And plus, my pals would take piss at me if I thought I was too big for my boots, you know <laughs> what I mean? I get the impression of talk to you, you're one of these boxers, and while you're confident that you're going to be a world champion with multiple belts, 
secure the future for your family, I think you also realise that every boxer is only one defeat away from yeah. a, something that could send your career back two years. Yeah, I think that some people forget that. I don't forget that for one. You know, you've always got to have it back in mind what could. You know, you don't dwell on that too much, but um, this is boxing, and one punch, like you say, can change a fight. You can pick up an injury, and I've always, I always go into the next fight thinking, this is everything. And when people expect you just to, like my last fight, everyone expected me just to beat Dennis Sealand, but I had a live opponent there, an unbeaten opponent, what a massive opportunity, and it's still another human being stood in front of me, who was trying to beat me, and people just expect, oh, Josh won't beat him. But it's the expectation that's come and course, carrying that yeah, Lee's yeah, banner, that old Josh it's... beats everybody. Yeah. You know, Josh isn't just, you know, Josh is going to beat Lee Selby, Carl Frampton, he'd do it on the same night, they think, yeah, you think, yeah, really? Yeah. Yeah. Of course, and it, it, is, it, is, it is pressure, but, um, you know, you, like I always go in there, I uh, give absolutely everything in, in the camp. I'm obsessed with training. And once I know when I walk to the ring, I'll give everything. And once I get in there, you know, what will be will be. And I'll go in there willing to die, you know what I mean? I, I, I embrace my missus before I walk out. And, you know, it's an horrible thing to say that because people do lose, lose life and stuff like that. But I embrace the missus when I leave her as well, like I'm never going to see her again because it's, you know, that, that's a risk we take getting in, that, in, in, in the ropes. And, uh, and, and when you go, you just, I want to give absolutely every, everything I've got. So Carl Frampton sings. Oh, that's when. Need to open air sing. Pressure. We haven't heard Lee Selby sing. Who's no, the best no. musician out of all of you? Do you well, think? I can play. I, I'm like I'm like an old, although I can't sing. I play guitar in the background. I reckon when you and Carl fight, it wins a pub yeah, afterwards. Yeah, we'll, afterwards, a pub we'll, afterwards, we'll have a pint at a Guinness. I think like uh, Carl would be a, a funny kind of character to go out with. So yeah, get him on mic, and I'll just I'll just sit him back playing guitar. He can be Liam. I'll be Noel. <laughs> <laughs> You're very cute, PR wise. As boxers go, and you know, you, you know, you've got to get put your face out there. Yeah, when did it first click how important it was for you to go out being a ticket seller? You know, if you're four weeks out from a fight on Saturday night, mm. you go in a pub after a Leeds game, all the lads have been on the last all afternoon. What's it like for you then? You know, because they're all going to want to hug off Josh. And um, my thing is, I've always been around folk, even since you've been a young lad. You know, my dad's a bit of a, a chirpy character, and he don't yeah. mind. He don't mind talking. He, he goes to Asda for a pint of milk, and he'd be there for an hour just because it turns into a social. You know, he stops and speaks to people, and I think I've kind of, I kind of caught that up as, as, as growing up. Um, in terms of the, that, the promoting myself for a while, like when social media started really coming to fruition on Facebook and Twitter, I thought. <sighs> Do I really want to be telling people what I'm having for, t for my tea? And a couple of my pals said, listen, you need to be doing it. You know, people want to see what, what goes mm. beyond behind behind closed doors. And I'm like, nah, they're, they're not bothered. But over the years, you learn that they do. You know, I, I enjoy watching documentaries about other sports people. So, you know, I've got to look at it like that. But to going out in, to pubs and, and spending time, like, uh, after football and then selling my own tickets, that just came with those who come and support me. I'm thinking, wow. There's an 18-year-old lad, and I've got grown men paying their hard-earned money to come and support me. Least I can do is go and have, you know, an orange juice or you know, a diet coke of them. Uh, and I just go along, and they'd like to talk about when they used to watch boxing. Oh, I remember when I used to watch Ben and Eubank and Collins and all that, and we'd reminisce about old boxing fights. And then they'd, I tell them about how I got into it and and what I'm looking to do. And I think then you get a personal connection. And it's like, I'd buzz off them telling me that they're well excited and they're right behind me. And I'd be coming away from them, I'd be like, you know what, I've got to do it for them, I've got to do it for them. And they'd buzz off me by saying, you know what, I've got this young lad, he's my pal Josh one in, he's going all the way to the top and I'm backing him. And that's what, you know, a lot of them will come to Arena and, the, the, you know, the thousands will come along. A lot of them, I have got a personal connection with them. And there's been some who well, have been there since day one, they have not missed, you know, a fight. I went to drop some tickets off on weekend to, to one lad. And his brother is get is having his stag do in Vegas on the the weekend of the fight, and he's get he's booked an early flight home because he's missed he hasn't missed one, even from so the. He's leaving his stag. Oh, he's leaving stag do. He's coming home. They said, listen, I am about to miss a fight. This is the world title. As I've watched him go from the small all shows when he was on shows, he was going an after main event. I've watched him win his first title 
and, and, and carry on through the journey. He said, there's no way that I had been there for his world title fight. And that's like the connection. And I'm proud of that. You know, I'm very proud of that because uh, it's not just, I always say it's not just me in there, it's, it's me. And, and, and like 10,000 other people. Yeah. You mentioned you'd tell me how you got into boxing. Tell us how you got into boxing. Well, just a bit of, uh, a lot of people, you know, I get into boxing because they're, they're causing mischief. I was just a young, lively young lad. I, I wasn't really a bad kid or all like that, so disciplined off me old fella. If we did, I stepped out of line and gave me a backhander. <laughs> and he's a big lad, so he, he wants so nice on old chops, but, um, yeah, just a lively lad, um, always active, out climbing trees, you know, causing mischief, but not too bad. And uh, I was always energetic, so, you know, my dad took me down to um local karate club, but it wasn't physical enough, it wasn't physical, so he took me to a boxing gym and the rest is history. I remember walking in, um, Star ABC, it's a big building on York Road, a lot of people know where Ivy Centre is and it's just over the road from there and Nicola Adams started out there and a few other, Jack Bateson did a bit of a spell down there and uh, I remember walking in, about seven years old and there was two lads sparring, knocking seven bells and I was just, I got a buzz. I instantly wanted to get his gloves on and get in there myself and from a young age I just loved the the, the battle of you know standing toe to toe and just and having it out and not wanting to take a step back and don't get me wrong, it was hard at times when you wanted to go play football or, or play rugby or go out with your pals and you've got to go to the gym. But uh, I stuck with it. My old fella always said to me, listen, if you're going to do something, don't half do it. You don't want to do the boxing, don't, don't bloody do it. You know, pack it in. But if you do want to do it, then you've got to give it 100%. I want you to go into training when, you, when you're supposed to go to training. And, and sometimes I, I wouldn't go for a few weeks and then I'd go back. But by time 11, I never missed sessions. It was just a bug. You know, I, I felt bad if I missed a, a training session. And I thought I needed to be there, so and I, I listen. I'd love to have uh, been a number nine for Leeds United, but I were I were no good. So <laughs> back then, did you see yourself becoming a world champion? Because at the start of your career, for t was about 14, 15 fights, you was on the road, weren't you? Mm, yeah, well, this is it. Um, I've always done the boxing. My thing when I turned pro, I've, you know, I've made it well known. Is my aspirations were British title, and we go from there. I think a lot of fighters these days are just the turn pro. And all of a sudden they start talking about talking about unifying division and if you set your bar too high and you don't you know achieve it or if you have a knockback it can affect you mentally for me you like just take small steps and we'll go from there you know um and i i think at the time when i turned pro i needed a job you know i needed i needed money i needed to learn how to drive i needed to buy a car i need to pay for insurance i need to fuel that car and buy training equipment so the job came up as a dental technician just being a lab assistant you know, uh, cleaning up and, and helping out. And then I took a bit of an interest in the job because I could make me on gum shields. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and all of a sudden, um, you know, the, the, the gaffer Phil Redding at the time said, listen, uh, look like you're taking a bit of an interest. If you, if, if you want to stick out, I'll send you to uni. So I were, I, at one point in my life, I was working four days a week, nine to five. And one day a week, uh, day release at university, uh, I was boxing on the evenings and on my day off on the on the Sunday I was going out selling tickets and trying to promote myself and uh, and any other time I, I, would, I was spending with Tash and it was hard and don't get me wrong it was, it was hard I, I, at times I think someone's got to give someone's got to give I just can't keep it up but then I keep telling myself you know it'll all be worth it in the end when if I had to stay late at work and I'm a sweeping floor you know when other people were going out on, on weekend and I was there on a Friday night going to the gym I, I used to be like thinking sick but I knew eventually that it would pay off. Not anything worth having in life, you've got to work for. And you know, you look at any like body who's done being successful, they've, they've put time and effort in. And uh, you know, no more, no more matter what happens now, I've got that you know degree from university. I, I graduated from uni. I've got that on my CV. And uh, and yeah, when I started boxing, I, I always said, listen, British title, and able to. Have an house in the car and be an happy man. And that's what it is. You're in a British town. Yeah, that's usually yeah, what it pays yeah, for if yeah, you have a few yeah. defences. And well, it seems like we've we've gone beyond that. And now, you know, my, my, my long term aspirations were always like you know you always have dreams, don't you? My, my long term aspirations were to to not just to look after my immediate family, like my wife and my kids, but was to look after my family, and my brothers and me and and and, and my dad. You know, I've got a. I've got two brothers, two sisters, you know, um, 
one of my brothers is uh, is registered special needs, and I've got a younger sister who's autistic. And because I'm the oldest, in, you know, oldest out lot, I feel like I'm like, you know, one of one at top of tree and I'd like to be able to turn around and say there you go dad mortgage paid off for you and just be like the king of family do you know what I mean like build an empire to be able to look after them all and, and that's my long term aspirations but the more the career has gone on the closer I'd be able to get to there and get a world title and you go beyond that then you know you can start really looking to, to do that. So it's ticket sales time now, Josh. Ticket sales, yeah, just um, oh, go have a chat with lads, everyone's excited, so it's another like another motivation, but always good to see lads as well. Oh, she's got car seats in them, so we'll go another car. Do you love boxing still as much as you did when you first started? Yeah. Because you know, you know that it's still there when you have fights and then you go missing out of gym for a week or two. And when you're itching to go back in, you know the love's still there, you know. And I watch fights on, 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 on TV now and, and when like two lads are having a, a bit of a tear up, like that's Elfin and Ronnie Clark fight you know, a week, you were watching that and I, obviously I wanted Elfin to win because he's my power but do you appreciate both fighters going at it and you get the buzz and, Next minute you're up off a sofa shadow boxing and <laughs> that's just the love you have, it never leaves you. And you say it's boxing becomes part of life and it's hard to it's hard to walk away. And listen, I know that it all comes to an end for me, you know, in the future. And I don't know how I'm gonna deal with that. But I know it, it will happen eventually. And there's no other feeling like it. How do you feel avoid of walking out in front of thousands of people and having the and, and giving your life you know to a training camp and then go again in the ring and just a man-to-man -man combat it's just there's no nothing else like it in life do you think you'll find it hard to adapt to life when it's over in a few years maybe so maybe so i get fat will you get fat you let's get fat so so <laughs> <laughs> no i said i said that because um, i've always been like quite slim and, and small so i think uh, i'd go down rule that rendell monroe's gone Build a, yourself yeah, up. going to bodybuilding, yeah. Is that what you yeah, think of yeah. doing, yeah? Just walk around like a carpet carrier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ronda Rendell's a bodybuilder now, isn't he? Yeah, he is. He's looking well. I seen him uh, last year uh, when Tommy Langford boxed down there, and he were he was looking some serious shape, you know, with some uh, big arms on him now. Yeah. Well, it's like Gary Sachs trains out of gym. Gary used to fight at a super feather, 9 4, and he's like, he's about 12 and a half stone now, and he's in some you know, good shape, so. I think um, I think I'd do that. I, I wouldn't like to let myself go so much. I'd like still like to keep in, in good physique, taking kids on holiday, and I don't want you know them to be ashamed of the dad walking around. The <laughs> Are 20 you quite chains. vain then? No, no, it's not that. It's, it's for them. It's for them, not me. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> they always say that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Will you stay in boxing? Do you think? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I think so. I, you know, certainly definitely go along to watch the shows. I've always said, you know, put Leeds on map. And uh, you know, help for younger talents come through. You know, like people like fighters like you know, Jack Bateson, for instance, and Mike Stable, maybe Reece Mold. They're getting opportunities to found these big shows. Prior to, to me coming through, you know, TV companies want entertaining leads because there's nobody about. Yeah. And uh, you know, now that I've been boxing, it's giving the, the younger fighters a chance to to come along and, and to showcase their skills in front of in front of thousands of fans in, instead of fighting in, in like leisure centres and uh, you know there's going to be some young guys on the card of next fight Ellen Road what a place to be to be having your, like your third or fourth fight you know what I mean and it don't come round it'll probably be the next 20 years before it comes again but you know, I'm glad that this this could potentially you know make a young lad That's or, what I was or, say, or a young yeah, lad I mean. at home think you know what I want to get into boxing and I've had messages on me on my social media account saying that they got into boxing because of me and blah blah blah. And hopefully when I retire and I'd like to be able to have the same exciting excitement of what a fan does now coming to my fights. You know, I often I often say I'd love to have a double, you know, to be going out with lads through day and the build up what they have, they go get a new outfit, they have to spend a you know, the day in pubs just getting pumped up for it and then when fight night comes they they didn't stand and they're going through it with me and I'd like to feel like that. You know, when I retire, what do you say to people? Else. Sorry, what do you say to people who say you, some of your fans are just football fugs or yeah. hooligans? Should we say it does? It does annoy me a little bit, that to be honest with you, because how can you like if 
define a sports fan to just one sport. You know, you're telling me that but every, you know, when Wimbledon come, comes round, everybody's getting tennis rackets out. Did you watch? Did you watch Murray over there? They're all talking about it. <coughs> yeah, he seems to be. Um, that when my fights come round, all the all football folks, all the all hooligans and stuff like that. The bo- they like the boxing. They're just they like football as well. And yeah, some of them might associate. But I'm, everyone knows that I'm I'm Leeds United mad and I'm Leeds proud. And you know, my channel together is like a city anthem. So if they sing that along, then it is what it is, isn't it? You know what I mean? And I think people get look into that a little bit too much. Oh yeah, it's just uh, they're just all football folks who go to Josh Warrington's fight. It's not the case whatsoever. You know, there's a little, there's a lot of boxing fans who just had nobody to local to, to latch on to now they've got a, a personal and a local interest to look to them and they come along, you know. You can't tell me that 80,000 and went to watch Fosh and Groves were all hardcore boxing yeah. fans. Or go to 70,000 going to Anthony Joe, yeah. go and watch Anthony yeah, Joshua exactly. at Wembley or Cardiff. Yeah, exactly. You know, you, you can't tell me that. It's, uh, some, some people come along to because it's an event and everyone else is going. Some people come along because they like all sports and they just want to come and watch some live sport. And some people come along because they're, they're your fans and they want to see you do well. And, uh, and you've got a mixture of the three there. You, just because you like, you know, you like football, doesn't mean that you can't like boxing and rugby and cricket. And yeah. you just stick to one sport, yeah. Because boxing on the whole is still pretty much like a. There's a few of you at the top of the tree in Britain, but it's still a minority sport to a lot of people. And these leisure centre shows and stuff, isn't it? Yeah, it's a bit of it's a bit of a niche market. And sometimes it's one of them things because there is so many boxers about. In uh, obviously British boxing, in, in terms, is booming with the amount of fighters and stuff and talent. But because there's so many about, you don't know who to follow. You don't know who to follow. But if there's a, a local fighter, you can say, you know what, he's a he's a Leeds lad, or he's a Manchester lad, or he's a Liverpool lad. I'm going to follow him and get behind him. You know, he's one of one of our own. You know, you don't see people from Liverpool saying, you know what, I'm going to go support uh, Aberdeen. You know what I mean? That's, that's not their local football team, is it? So it's kind of similar with, with, with boxing. Unless you have like real characters, like you know, people might want to fill up Billy Joe Saunders because he's because he's because he's a hell of a character. He's funny, or Tyson Fury, or people might want to follow uh, Terry Flanagan because of his you know he's a, he's a slick boxing. He's, he's good to watch. So. He's, You've got to have someone what attaches to the fans, and you know, I'm, I'm proud to say I'm, I'm putting, especially when Leeds United have gone through like a terrible time, it's given the fans someone to go along and cheer to, you know, someone positive, and a lot of them have come on board like that. So you're driving us through Leeds here, it's a big old city, isn't it? Yeah, we're going on, we're going on Outer Ring Road, they call this the Outer Ring Road, because we, we could go through City um, straight through the city centre, but we're going to get stuck in traffic. Um, and there's really road works going on, it's a pain in the ass, I hate traffic. So we're going now, we're ring walked. Yeah, to drop some tickets off. I see. Yeah. Listen, I'll see you before, we'll let see me know when you want to. I'll definitely. come meet up and see you. Okay. All right, see you later, you'll get back to me. Yeah, see right. you soon, bye mate. You mean the world to these people, don't you? Yeah, that's what it's about. Moments and answers. Yeah. You love your city, which is obvious, and, and your, eyes, your eyes are still illuminating when you talk about loving boxing as much as you did 20 years ago. Yeah. How will you cope when you don't have boxing? When I say but don't have boxing, when you aren't boxing anymore? Um. When I'm not boxing anymore, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll have left a legacy behind Fort City. You know, make, made a bit of history for Fort City. The youngsters can always say that, you know, in, in boxing history, only the first world champion with Josh Warren, and, and hopefully they'll be able to say, I want to be like him, or, or I got into boxing because of him, and that'll be something I'll be very proud of. When I finish boxing, I'd like to go, you know, give back and, and help the, the next uh, budding world champion from Leeds and the city. So yeah, I'd like to, you know, put me my time and effort back into uh, back into boxing. People go on about um, you being a great ticket seller and having the odd stacks in your favour that way. Say there's twenty five thousand people in Ellen Road cheering on its Lee Selby. How many of them do you think you might have met or will know or will know someone or will they know someone you've met? 
Oh, there'll, there'll be plenty of, you know, one way or another, I'll have, I'll have shaken them around, paused for a picture, or at least had a couple of minutes about boxing or, 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 or football or something like that. Um, you know, like I say, I can't help myself. If I, were, if I were to go to an event, I'd make sure that everybody were happy with a picture. You know, some people might think they're too big for the boats and then I don't need to do that, but end of the day, the people make it. Without fans and, and the people supporting you, who would we be? You know what I mean? And still, and still. Tell us a bit about your training teams. It seems your dad, Sean, oversees things and there's other people who work with you. Yeah, seems, to, yeah, seems to work well having different people doing different things. My dad's always been a main trainer and uh, people have said over here, ah, you, need to, you need to have a look about, you need to have a look about if you want to get to the next level. And I've said that from like, you know, area title level. Yeah, if you want to get to that next level though, you're going to have to leave your dad behind. Because I don't, I don't know why, maybe because he hadn't got a big boxing background himself. Does that always mean, mean that you're not a good trainer? No, the way that he analyses fights and the way that he comes up with strategies and game plans, you know, he's very, he's second to none, he's never been one of us, you know, and, and, and other fighters he's worked with, he's always been successful with. Um, but he, he's not afraid to take a step back and let someone else come in. Like, a couple of uh, fights, camps ago, his hands have been playing up, so he knew he couldn't do pads as well anymore. So he got a pad man in, someone's a bit faster, a bit sharper. Um, when we start getting onto a big title level, you've got another pair of eyes in, in, in Nick Manners, uh, you know, a, another former fighter from Leeds, just to cover another angle when they're like watching the sparring and watching the training. Because you know, uh, one, two pair of eyes is better than one pair of eyes, and and then like strength conditioning, you know, we've got Mike Early, always in there. So yeah, we, it's, it's quite a bit of a, a broad team, but all them different heads work together. You know, they talk to each, we all talk to each other and, and come up with a game plan and uh, it works well, it works well. You look at a football team, you know, there's about 50 backroom staff, you know, elite level in the Premier League and, you know, Championship. And, uh, you know, sometimes boxing is just left to one one I know it's only one fight in the ring, but with so much going on, you need to have a good team around you. Seven and eight, seven and eight year old, yeah. He came down to the gym and uh, I can't remember why we're down there, to be honest. He was just having a knockabout on bags and uh, it's just interest from there. I mean, he, he, previous to coming into the boxing gym, he'd been doing a little bit of judo because he was always a lively kid. Always mischievous. Very, very small for his age. You know, premature when he was born, so. Really, I just wanted to get him exercising, and uh, they told us that his lungs had suffered a lot of damage um, during birth. So, what we did was, we, instead of wrapping him up like they told us to wrap him up and cut him, we'll take him away. We, uh, I spoke to various doctors and things, and some of them made suggestions that we kind of get him involved in exercise. So, there was a friend of mine uh, who I used to work with, and he ran a a karate club and a bit of judo and all this carry on. So he started that first and he, he spent like a year at that but then he was getting bored and couldn't keep his concentration and, and my pal says to me, he said what it is with him, it's pure, he just wants to fight. That's all he wants to do is fight so it kind of started from there, you know. And are you a bit of a geek in the sense that you keep a record of every single session you do, is that correct? And what yeah. you eat and your times and <coughs> running? That's right, yeah, I remember watching uh, Carl Froch, uh, a fair few years ago, he would do it. He would doing it, but I just started doing it around that time as well. Um, I think just got to a stage with like speaking to Mark, and he's always kept a, a record book on what we do and, uh, and writing out the sessions. And you know, I thought, you know what, I'll do something similar here because you know I'd, I could tell people what what I could do four miles in or five miles or six miles in, but then I thought, you know what, I want to tr try beat them paces. So I'm writing down the time, and then when you come up to the title level fights. You look back at your previous camp and you think, I'm going to beat that this camp, I'm going to beat this. And, and over the years, I've seen my body shape change. Oh, OK, yeah, I have matured, but constantly being in the gym, you know, having a week off after, after the fight and then straight back into the gym, 
ticking over and then when camp starts I'm already fit. I've seen like my records being smashed and if I look back to three years ago, you know, I'm a completely different person in, the ter in terms of like my fitness and, and what I've like lifting the strength conditioning and what I can do my running and how well I can do like 12 rounds of sparring and stuff like that. So yeah, it's, it's all good data and you look at elite level sports, some like, I don't know, it's Team Sky with cycling, you know, Dave Brailsford. It's those tiny little increments what can make a massive difference, what people sometimes overlook. And in other sports, they do it, you know, rugby, football, you know, athletics, they all have tiny little differences which make, separates the, the, the athletes, but we overlook it in boxing at times. When did, when did you first think, hold on, he might be decent at this boxing? I think probably when he was about, he done a few bouts, he done three or four bouts. He suffered a couple of losses then. Uh, and then I kind of took over training him. Um, but he was, when I was a good trainer, his interest, he was focused, he was switched on, and he just wanted to fight. So it was one of them where I didn't really know they were going to be any good at it until he kind of hit the um, youth level, maybe at 14, 15. And he started to mix it with some of the best in the country then, you know. We didn't always get the decisions, but uh, it was pretty obvious that he, he was up there with them. Uh, so at 18, we were, we'd not really had a lot of interest from England squads or even Yorkshire squads. So what we did was we decided that we weren't going to go anywhere. They'd picked all the teams for squads and uh, we thought what we'd do is we'd have a go at pro game, you know. Uh, he did the usual thing. He had one or two seasoned guys, journeymen, for his first few fights. And then we've kind of, from then, we've not really been fed at journeymen or people that were expected to be. I mean, every time we we step up, you know, we, we can't win. People are saying, what do you expect who are there to be? But it won't, I mean, we fought guys with unbeaten records and better records than us, higher rankings than us. You know, so we've done everything that he's been asked to do, really. Was it a natural for you to train him? Did you think, well, maybe he should go somewhere else that was a pro? Or? Well, we, he did that as an amateur. And to be honest, I, I started a little bit of training as an amateur, as an amateur coach. And we've kind of grown together. I'm not knowing what I know now. I don't really think these trainers that claim that it's all they're doing. I, I don't believe that. I think sometimes a fighter develops a trainer, and, and the training. I think you grow together. I think it's more about a bond than one man being in control and calling out shots. You know. Um, but no, I, I started as a, an amateur trainer, and causes me some so he tends to run along with things together. Um, turned professional a couple of years before him and then a friend of mine in bands with John Blackwell were um, taking him out for his amateur fights and another friend of mine who's club we were with, Jason Gledel from Kelly's in Leeds. Um, they put a lot of time and a lot of effort, you know. No, it's, it's not just been me who's trained him, there's been other people involved, you know. Um, I've been a little bit more hands on since uh, he kind of started moving up Nankins, winning titles and uh, yeah, it's, it's been all that, it's been a good Steve story. Wood's been there since day one as well, hasn't he? Steve has, I mean, we um, we started with Chris Ashton and Steve Wood. And days went bored and allow you to go and manage. But then they made a ruling where you had to make a decision and uh, no disrespect to Chris, but what happened there was, Chris has had a little whisper, we're going to go with Steve, and he sent me a nasty text before I'd made any decision. And I thought, well, that's made my mind up for me. You know? <laughs> Spoke to Steve and uh, went with Steve, but still, fr still friends with Chris. I like Chris. He's uh, had a lot of time for him, you know. But yeah, Steve's been there from day one, along with along with us, and uh, you know he's, he's done a he's done a good job. What's it mean for you? We've been fighting for a world title. What does that mean to you, the trainer and the parent? <laughs> It's not a massive shock at the minute. I mean, we've done all them fights. We've built, we've built as fan base nice and slowly, and we've done what we've had to do. Um, so it's not like one minute we've been nowhere, next minute bang your ear. It's a big shock because we've kind of grown into it, haven't we? We've, we've grown with it slowly, but a well title is what everybody dreams of, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it is. It's what everyone dreams of. Do you ever fall out, you two? I don't fall out with him, but he falls out with me. Yeah. You're a bit too old school for him sometimes. It's always, it's always his fault. 
Yeah. You know, they like, get cranky, don't they? And they always know best. Let's talk about the couple of fights you've had on BT and Box Nation uh, and you, what, what you can recollect from them. Um, Kiko Martinez, where people, where you were my favourite, but people were saying, this is where it will end for you as well, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's uh, the old one, uh, old chestnut. Of, I want to get exposed now. Um, yeah, going in after 11 months off, um, a bit of an operation on my elbow, had a bit of kale surgery on that. Um, and, you know, changing promoters, going over, you know, with, signing with Frank and, and just having a bit of delay, getting him out. I wanted to come back with a bit of a big fight and, uh, you know, there were a few other names that were spoken, but they didn't really whet my appetite and I, I mean, when you're fighting in front of thousands of fans and, because we've been fighting at a high level for such a long time, people expect me to be fighting these, these top names and the few names what got mentioned, I just didn't think they'd be good enough to, for me to get up for and for, for the fans to, to get excited about. Um, and I know that people wanted to just see me just come back in with a steady one because having you know, inactivity is not good for a fighter, but I wanted, a, I wanted a test, I wanted a challenge and I trained real hard for that fight and uh, I felt good. I felt like Martinez, I don't think he's going to see final belly. I was, I was flying in sparring, I was doing 12 rounds like a breeze, eating hard and then when I got into the fight, <clears throat> Obviously, you have your initial, you know, a bit of cobwebs. So I've been out for so long, but you know, I, I started pumping my jab away. And after the third round, I come back to the corner. Me, you know, fell up. He took straight away. So what you done to your hand? I said, I don't know, but I said, it's, I can't feel a thing. And uh, well, I'd, I'd torn a ligament in my hand, but it's swollen up like a balloon, and I couldn't feel it every time I popped a jab and landed on top of his head. You know, I just had no feeling whatsoever. So that little bit, a couple of inch, it was taking away my distance. So I couldn't really lead the shop, my shots. So it was a bit rusty one to come back with. I got the decision, but I didn't, I didn't perform as well as I, I would like to. Um, some good experience in there, but uh, you know, I think coming back in the fight after, I shown what I'm capable of doing and what the best. Yeah, and of course, um, Dennis Sealand, where memorable stoppage win for you but also what's memorable for a lot of people was your celebration when you got I think you got all your knees yeah, your both yeah. knees and it was almost like I'm there now nobody can deny me whatever yeah yeah it, completely just that what you, what you just said I think because um, 2000 back in the 2016 was such a frustrating year for me you know I'd started really well I'd be uh, Isasha Amigasi really well and then there were talks of the Selby fight happening and then I got like national you know criticism for for, for bottling the Selby fight which is not the case whatsoever. All I wanted was a change of day. You know that that's it. Um, I still felt like, and I still believed that I was young enough and fresh enough to, to not worry about you know missing that day, and uh, I, I would get more opportunity at world title. But everybody wrote me off. You know, you'll never get your shot now. You'll you, that, you were gifted one then. You should have taken it while you had the chance because you'll never win a world title. And that's what they said. And I just come away from that frustrating year and thinking, you know what? I'll prove you all wrong. You'll see. And you know, slowly, slowly we chipped away. We had the Martinez fight, and then all of a sudden, you know, Frank had got the put me in position for for a mandatory, you know, challenge, and uh, well, the final eliminator. And that fight, I I, I said them things after the fight because a lot of a lot of emotion there, especially from 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 Selby's team at the time, like a few years ago. It's it's a you know, you, nah, you'll never get an opportunity. Josh Warren will never fight for the world title. Never fight me certainly won't fight me because that, that's got long gone and it's dead and buried and uh, going into that fight I'm, not, you know, I'm that close away but then there's people saying oh no it's, it's, you're not going to get you're going to get found out here and when I when I did it I knew I was going to do it it all just came out then it was like deny me now how can you deny me now I've done it I've made it myself I'm mandatory challenger and I won't be denied and I'm not going to stop now I'm going to go on and win the world title and when you fight Lee Selby, how will you control your emotions? Not just that atmosphere, but also thinking what Selby said about you when you didn't fight him the first time because of your your marriage um, taking place. Experience, experience. All right, I've not boxed uh, for a world title before, and uh, probably Lee Selby is probably the best opponent who I'll be in with. But I will say that experience of fighting in the big crowds and having the pressure on on my shoulders already and I say that because in space of 12 to 18 months I went from fighting in small old shows in front of a couple of thousand to 10,000 at Leeds Arena having interviews with national press, national radio stations, um, 
TV camera crews from, from all over the place and that all happened in a short space of time and all of a sudden I was the next Ricky Hatton because I had all these fans behind me and I, would have, I was just a, a lad off at a state and I was an exciting fighter and come forward and I ran away with it and I think it showed in my performance when I boxed Dennis Tilbron because I just, boxing skills went out of the window and I just, I would have I was like a novice in there, but I managed to get the win, but I've learned a massive lesson then. And, and, and from then on, I worked a lot on, you know, keeping your focus and, 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 and the mental side of, of being in a big occasion. And I've carried on that through, you know, in, in, in the fights, what I've been in since then. So uh, once I get out of them change rooms and I begin a ring walk, all stinkers are on, I don't see no else. And the only voice I hear is my dad and my corner team, and that's it. What will Josh Warrington have achieved as a boxer when he finally calls it the day? World champion, hopefully unified world champion. Um, done everything I've, I've wanted to do. You know, I set out to, to win the British title and everything after that with a bonus. European, got on the belt, international titles and, uh, and now I've set my goal on a world title and, and unified. I keep talking about it so I want to do it and we want to get something in my head. You know, a couple of well-titled belts on mantelpiece would look well, I think.